one thing that you mentioned was the, the, the combinations of uh, lenalidomide and, and uh, rituximab. And, and John, you had a nice uh, JCO paper in, in 2015, and I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about that study. Sure. So um, that was part of an alliance study that we developed in part to start to add new drugs to rituximab uh, in sensitive patients, in patients that had relapse disease, not refractory disease. So um, the ultimate design of that study looked at single agent rituximab, I'm sorry, single agent lenalidomide or lenalidomide plus rituximab. So again, both arms were in some ways experimental. It's important to understand in this trial that this were, these were relapse patients, not refractory patients. So they were a little more favorable relapse patients than you would uh, have in some studies by design for a variety of reasons. So in these rituximab relapse patients or chemo rituximab relapse patients, Lenalidomide had about a 50% response rate uh, lasting over a year. Uh, and then when you look at uh, the combination of lenalidomide, rituximab, uh, the response rate went up to about 75% with the uh, progression-free survival being about two years. So clearly a big difference, again, in a, uh, in a relapsed population, not a refractory population. So there's an ongoing randomized trial now looking at that called the AUGMENT trial. It has some, some similarities to our study design, but it's a phase three trial looking, again, in relapse follicular patients, looking at rituximab alone versus rituximab lenalidomide. So we'll see uh, kind of how that plays out. I would, I would say that uh, other agents, uh, and, and Leo alluded to this, I would say that um, ibrutinib is a drug that has activity in follicular lymphoma. We've seen a variety of, uh, of studies in, the, in that population. A little bit uh, more data in the more resistant patient population uh, in, in studies that have suggested that the response rate in a, in a rituximab resistant population is about 20 percent. Again, meaningful but, but lower in some ways. Um, PFS about four months or so, but some patients going out longer. On the other hand, um, idelalisib and, and, and idelalisib, I would echo Leo's comments, although it does have that indication in the refractory population and probably is a little bit better in the refractory population where the pivotal data with idelalisib is at about 50% in about a year. So I still, with caution, in those patients who have been through chemotherapy, uh, I will still use idelalisib in some cases. I think it's a manageable drug. It's, it's one that now that we have a pretty good sense of what the toxicities can be, um, we watch the patient carefully and, and, you know, if they're febrile, we do the appropriate workup, we give pneumocystis prophylaxis, uh, and I think uh, I, I have a number of patients doing well on it. So I, I wouldn't throw that out at this point, and I, not that that's what you were saying, um, but I do think that in a selected patient population with careful use, it can be useful. So. In my mind, the issue is the duration of the last response. How long does it take the patient to progress? If they have sensitive disease, long prior remission, you can do whatever you want to do. If they have a short remission, they're becoming refractory, you need to change the modality of treatment. That's the person where I might be more prone to give something like idelalisib. That's where I would be thinking about stem cell transplant, which still has an important role in follicular lymphoma, despite all of our new toys. Um, you know, there are patients. And I think the other point to, to be made for the audience in, in follicular is every time that patient relapses, you have to think about transformation. You just at least clinically have in your mind, have to look at that patient and say, am I worried about transformation? Is their LDH high? Is one disease site out of proportion to the others? If I got a PET scan, is the SUV high? Do they need a biopsy? to really chase after that. So um, that's the other, I think, take home message is the, the transformation issue. And certainly in those patients, transplant most definitely goes up higher on the list as well. Yeah, as a transplanter, I just want to point out that we do have very good data now with, with non-mild ablative transplantation with very low early uh, transplant morbidity mortality, but you know, moderate to significant rates of, of long-term graft versus host disease. But, but really outstanding long-term survival. This mm -hmm. is clearly a curative modality. And I think you can actually begin to identify those patients that you're thinking about transplant pretty early in the, in the course, right. I think. So. Uh, one, one of the things about idolisib that makes it attractive versus a lot of the chemotherapy combinations or, leno, or lenalidomide even in the refractory patient, if they've had a lot of chemotherapy and they have cytopenias and it's not due to something else, is you know, idolisib does not cause cytopenias. And it's sort of an enigmatic drug in that as you move it, 
earlier in the course of therapy, you tend to see more toxicity, whereas when you give it to patients who've had multiple, multiple therapies, it, it, you know, it tends to be better tolerated in terms of the LFT abnormalities and you know, potentially other side effects. And you know, the, it's, a, a lot was made of the, infection, you know, of the infectious risk, but that was identified over multiple phase three studies, so a very large number of patients. And you know, the safety signal was in the phase, the early work, and it's just really prophylaxing people when it's appropriate, you know, and, and I, I echo your, your sentiment that some patients can do very well on that drug for a long period of time.